This is the Brad House Sports Show. And now for this week's completely different and humorous perspective on everything sports, here's Brad House Mike and Sidekick. All righty, well, welcome back to the frat house triage here. Uh, as yeah. we have certainly had a, a tough go of it in the past three weeks or so, trying to get a show in under our belt. Two weeks ago, for two weeks now, I was down with the flu. And now, uh, well, so we, we, yeah, sidekicks on the sideline uh, this week uh, as well. As, uh, well, the flu bug has run rampant through the frat house. But, yeah, man. hey, well, we've got Uncle Mark here, and we're keeping it all together as we're going to be talking sports from last week, from right. this week, yeah. and stuff coming up into the future. <laughs> uh, and I missed, I, I felt bad because I missed last week's uh, baseball show. So I thought I, I had to don the, the, the throwback. It's Throwback Thursday as it is. Mm. I had to don the throwback uh, gear uh, for this evening because it'll probably be the last time I care to pull out the Phil's gear anyhow this season. No shucks. But, uh, oh, shucks. Yeah, it's nice yeah. to have you back. Well, uh, listen, I, and I got to tell you, it does, I, I feel I, I feel really good to be back. Yeah, good. And I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, it, it's been a long road, and uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Good. Pretty good. Good. Um, that's what I'm but, talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about sports that happened. Mm-hmm. A little bit of sports <clears> is coming up. How about, uh, I got I to gotta throw it at you because, well, uh, what the heck, I'd throw it at whoever would be sitting here. Uh, but <laughs> is that a pie? I'm gonna throw it at you. Uh, we got the Masters this weekend. You yeah, into, you into a little bit of Masters? I action, agree. Huh? Yeah, you know, last year I did. I watched Adam <clears throat> Scott. Right. Uh, there you that, go. that actually was pretty compelling. I am expecting rain. I mean, you kind of have to expect some rain <laughs> during the Masters. <laughs> But uh, uh, gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous facility there really in Augusta. Is. I mean, that, that is a lot of... A tradition like none other. Yeah, yes, right. we got to watch. And you got to talk in whispers. Got to speak in whispers. I, I, you know, uh, listen, I, I, follow, I follow PGA, I follow golf, but the Masters is something special. Yeah. I, I, I do... I don't, you know, I'm not watching it today. I'm not watching it tomorrow. But by Saturday, I'll probably start checking a little bit of that. It's one of the boys of summer kind of things, yeah, too. Yeah, when the yeah. Masters Augustus are back and the baseball's back, you kind of know, all right, we're in for a good stretch, yep. hopefully, of uh, Absolutely. You know, nice weather. But so the, we'll be checking a little bit. You can bet that's going to be on the docket here at the frat house this coming weekend. Uh, but let's clean up some other sports. How about that? We're going to clean that up. And it was just three weeks ago this evening, we were all sitting here in a lather getting ready for the NCAA tournament. And I was exclaiming about how that is one of my absolutely favorite times of the year. Well, it's over, folks. It's done. Yeah, it all concluded up on Monday evening with the championship game between, are, are you ready? I mean, who saw this one coming? A number seven seed in the Kentucky or in the Yukon uh, Huskies against a number eight seed in the Kentucky Wildcats. <laughs> Nobody saw. And in fact, in a couple of moments, you're going to see our, our breakdown on our, on our frat house uh, bracket challenge. Nobody had either one of them coming out of this whole thing. Uh, but I got to tell you, it was, it, I mean, it, that's to me what makes the tournament special. Anybody can get to the championship. And it was proven right there. Um, not that I was a big fan of either one of the teams. But, hey, but, but listen, congratulations go out to the UConn Huskies who won their fourth national championship, their fourth ever Dating back to 1999, this time the first time without a coach by the name of Jim Calhoun. So, um, and you got to give it to Ollie. Boy, you know, the guy just came on, second year coach, former NBA professional. He's, he's everybody's sweetheart right now. You got to bet he's going to be being looked at well, by some I was, NBA teams. Yeah, I was just about to say, I think, you know, there's probably uh, some pro and maybe a couple other college programs might be looking to try to snag him. Huh? Oh, l- listen, he's not going to want to go anywhere, but, I mean, if it's another college team, forget it. You're going to stay right where you are. Mm-hmm. But I could see a pro team. We're going to talk Taking about a, a possible coach right. jumping over to the pros. Maybe this one team might be looking at a guy like Ollie. You never know. But we'll, we'll talk about that one in a moment. But uh, uh, we're going to go. Interesting, an interesting side note here. Yep. 
the the Huskies also won the women's. Right. Yes, they did. Now yes, that was did. a multiple. Clean. They they've wow, been wow, winning, wow, right? They have. Yeah. I mean, you guys this is not like their first or second. They no, yeah. nice job, Brandon. Thank Gino you. Gino Oriana, the coach, has like eight or nine. I think. Yeah, right, nine. right. I, and I mean, he's so from the local area, by the way. Yeah, yeah Gino Oriana. He's, he's from this area. In fact, he used to coach out at one of the local Catholic high schools uh, right here in this area. But uh, the UConn women are renowned. That's great. And um, we're going to be talking for a moment about Kentucky, mm. but uh, the UConn women's program, not dissimilar to the Kentucky men's program, is an automatic recruitment magnet. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to work to get people to come <laughs> to that school. They just automatically yeah. go there. <clears throat> this is the second time, I believe, that the men and women – have won in the same year. I'm thinking, and don't quote me on it, but I believe, I don't have my, you know, if I had, maybe, maybe somebody could check it real quick, but I believe it was 2004 okay. was the last time that both the men and women. Same university. Exactly, won the through. NCAA That's tournament. That's pretty cool. So, that is pretty yes, cool. Yes, nicely done to the UConn women as yeah. well. Nice job. <clears throat> but as I just said, let's go take a look real quick at our, uh, at our, well, we had our, our bracket going, our bracket challenge, our frat house sports mm. bracket challenge. Congrats goes out to our buddy Dino uh, from over there at CLW83. You can catch him over on CLW83 over there with Jim Williams and with our, our buddy Carl uh, on some of the programming they do there. Uh, came out on top. Uh, that buddy sidekick, uh, well, he's not here. Yeah. You know what he's doing? He's ducking. Is that what he did? Uh, he's ducking. He, he, oh, boy. he didn't want to hear me tonight. Call him out <laughs> in fraud uh -oh, uh -oh. of the fact uh -oh. that he cheated I can't believe to get to the what? number three spot. But look, cheaters never win. Uh. You're number three, buddy. Number three. Uh, All right, uh, uh, there oh it is. So that's how the rest of it I came in. I can't believe it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What this goes to prove is that if you knew anything about <laughs> college hoops at all, you don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, well, come on. Just out of curiosity, I just want to real quick just run down. If you take a look at who everybody picked for a championship, there's not a single choice there for Nobody UConn. Had it. Nobody had it. Or Kentucky. Nobody had it. From anybody. Nope. In a group of 16. So there no. you have it. Uh, as I pointed out, nobody had that one coming out of it. Oh, that was some Try fun Try it again intro. next year. Some fun <laughs> intro right there. How about yeah, we go okay. take a look at our big stories of the week? Here we go. And listen, since we're sticking with, well, we're talking about college basketball, yeah. we're talking about the NCAA, we're going to stick with the NCAA and a little bit of college basketball, maybe throw in a little pro basketball as well. Uh, since we're, we, we started it out that way, uh, the other night, about an hour before tip time of the big national championship game between, as I pointed out, Kentucky Wildcats and the UConn Huskies, uh, a rumor was spread out that, in fact, John Calipari, the longtime coach of the Kentucky Wildcats uh, would be leaving at the conclusion of this current game, regardless of its outcome, and would be heading to the Los Angeles Lakers to take over as the head coach there. That was going to be a done deal. Right? In Dave, fact, exactly was, yeah, right. Yeah, that's how deal. it was phrased. It was phrased that it was going to be a done deal. Right. Now, I got to be honest with you, folks. Uh, I, I won't deny it. Um, Calipari is not one of my favorite uh, uh, people in the world, and uh, frankly, uh, it, it wouldn't bother me in the least. In fact, I might even find it somewhat enjoyable to watch this guy <laughs> twist in the wind of the mess that is out there right now in Los Angeles, to find himself dealing in the uh, all the dysfunctionality of the Lakers, embroiled in the media hype and all the nonsense and the attention and the mess that goes with them, and then try to watch him balance the biggest ego in all of the NBA in Kobe Bryant, I frankly would absolutely love it and enjoy it. But to consider for a moment that this guy would even consider going to a team like the LA Lakers is absolutely ludicrous. And in fact, it was almost proven, I think, within less than 24 hours that the whole thing was, in fact, a joke. Um, as I pointed out, uh, regardless of whether I like the guy or not. The fact of the matter is Kentucky, and in many respects, it's as a result of Calipari, he has turned Kentucky into an absolute recruiting magnet, men's magnet. Mm -hmm. He <clears throat> has to do nothing. When you take a look at just the past five years, six seasons, seven seasons, 
how many of his players leave from there to go out to um, the uh, uh, NBA um, and, and draft picks, um, it, it's absolutely astounding what, what, what happens. Um, so this guy, it, it, players want to come to Kentucky. That's without what they want to do. Yep, without a doubt. Uh, Third uh, most, uh, they what? Uh, now I'm just looking here. Yep. Their value surged at about a third. Mm-hmm. Okay, over the last three years, uh, 32.5 million, uh, making them the third uh, highest generating um, uh, basketball college. program. Yeah, over that, the last. I'm talking basketball programs only. That's exactly, just the basketball exactly. program. Over and the that's last just three the years. men's basketball program. Right, and that's all under his watch. Correct. I mean, there's no two ways around it. I mean, Correct. the guys, you know. Plus, this guy's making $5.5 million a year. I was just year. about to say, if we start talking compensation, the numbers are staggering. Dude. Exactly. Really staggering. Why in the world would he would, want would to? Would you go to exactly. L.A.? I don't know how much more money you would I, get, and who wants the aggravation? Can, can I be honest? Living in the shadow of, uh, you know, Phil Jackson. We that, have maybe? seen college coaches try to make the jump right. to the NBA, and some very, very good college coaches. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly remembering uh, Rick Pitino making the jump over to the, late, over right. to the uh, New York Knicks. Mm-hmm. You you take these guys out of their element. You put them into into that kind of a fishbowl. Right. John Calipari would be eaten up and chewed up and spit out inside of 18 months in the L.A. media. That's it. He'd be gone. And speaking of which, in some respects, I got to tell you right now, I feel bad for Mike D'Antoni, who right now is the current coach over there at the Lakers. Uh, you take a look at the mess that, and, 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 and the beatdown that this man, mm. a veteran himself, yeah. an, an NBA veteran, has had to take with this particular team. The maligning that he has taken from the media out there, from the national media, from the local media in particular, and from his own team internally, is absolutely uncalled for, for a guy who, in my opinion, has a lot of class. Maybe, in fact, he's a little bit out of his out of his environment, mm-hmm. maybe it's not the right place for him to be, but God darn it, what they have done to this guy out there is absolutely wrong. Whether you like him or not, D'Antoni, in my opinion, has been inappropriately maligned, <clears throat> and whether you like him or not, John Calipari shouldn't be punished this way. John Calipari, stay right where you are. That's the best place for you. Well, let me ask you, though, if yeah. Calipari were to go to L.A., don't you yeah. suppose that might, because he's put so many um, youngsters into the NBA, don't you think that naturally would be maybe, what would you say, a recruitment tool to get some of those players to come play for him? Well, let's not forget, though, we're not talking about, I mean, you're talking about an NBA squad with a roster of 15 mm. players, mm. okay? Mm. Not the kind of rosters you're talking about in right, the, the college, NCAA. Right. Acknowledged. That's number and one. It number is two, contracted. It's a little different. And, yeah, and you're going in, in right. and you're inheriting most of your starting lineup. Uh, you know, am I saying that Calipari wouldn't have any success? No, he may have some early success. It's very possible. I don't think though, LA would be the place to do it mm-hmm. because he's going to go in inheriting. If he would be allowed to build the team, might be different. That is post be- Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. Okay, post a uh, 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 Nash. Okay, get rid of some of this dead weight that's still hanging around there that's influencing this team horribly. Oh, doubt. Get rid of that and be allowed to build the team. Then, in fact, you be. Uh, but as you well know, that's not the no, nature of professional sports happen. in any sport. No, it's not and so, therefore, happen. it's not going to happen. Stay yeah. right where you are, John Calipari. You're doing a better job despite the fact I don't agree with a lot of your philosophies. And listen, Dan Tony, it'd be nice, uh, you know, there was some uh, chatter with him. Of course, he came out and said, listen, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, yes. in response, because the, the media did quiz, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, you know, he's an alum of Marshall. And although I don't know if Marshall will be willing to, to pay the kind of price that he's getting right now with the L.A. Lakers, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, he might actually find a nice Find a nice fit po- over there. I mean, uh, Coach Harry and Tom Harrion is out after four years from uh, the Marshall uh, mm-hmm. uh, program. Uh, he did guide them to the NIT in 2012. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that was, in, in a certain respect, uh, what's going on there in Marshall has been on the upswing. Hey, who knows? Maybe Dan Tony <clears throat> prefers it and ought to go back to the Last word time. I heard was that Marshall is actually narrowed down their list of candidates. Dan mm-hmm. Tony's not one of them. Okay. Right. Uh, Dan Tony, I think, probably is better suited, in my personal opinion, as an NBA coach. Will he survive it, do you think? Not here. Not here. I I mean, I'm not saying he won't won't make it through next season. 
he, they may open the season with him next year. He may not make and it through the entire season. Right. He's got one year left on his contract. Interim Correct. coach or something, right? Yep. Okay. All right. <clears throat> since we're sticking with the uh, – since we're talking NCAA, let's stick with that one for a moment because uh, th this is a story that is just continuing to develop. I think it's going to continue to develop probably for quite a long time. And uh, uh, I certainly hope that – well, let's put it this way. I certainly hope I'm around long enough to continue to cover it right through to its fruition. It's going to be that long? It's going to be that long. Wow. I really believe that. Holy and that smokes. is uh, something that I've been reporting on over on our Facebook page, and I just kind of – Put it up there, and you might find them as many times as two or three times a week. The NCAA under siege. Um, let, let's take a look at th this one. Uh, you know, I, I just got done talking about Calipari. He actually had a rather interesting quote just actually, I think it was a couple of days ago, uh, where he made a terrific, a terrific, what I thought was analogy, comparing what is currently happening right now in the NCAA to the crumbling of the Soviet Union saying, quote, the situation reminds me a little of the Soviet Union in its last years. It was still powerful. <clears throat> it could still hurt you, but you could see it crumbling, and it was just a matter of time before it either changed or ceased to exist. Wow. And that's exactly what we are witnessing right before our very eyes, and I think it is one of the most compelling stories going on right now in amateur, student, athletic, collegiate sports. Add fuel to the fire that I just posted yesterday, a report that, uh, I, and I posted it up on our Facebook page, that the powerful SEC, the Southeastern Conference, uh, had reported just yesterday that it had generated revenues of, are you ready, $314.5 million in fiscal year 2013. Wow. A revenue <laughs> increase of, folks, are you ready, $41 million. million. Now, it's no wonder that we've got people like Ed O'Bannon out there right now, the uh, UCLA star and former couple of year NBA professional who is out there uh, heralding the lawsuit for all of the student athletes to be paid. Ed O'Bannon has filed a class action lawsuit that is gaining some traction. It has been in the courts now for the better part of about 18 to 24 months and apparently is scheduled to get a hearing very, very shortly, perhaps maybe as early as this summer. In fact, the whole crux of this is he is insisting that student athletes must be paid. Now, in the meantime, we're not done. We've got volleys coming from all over the place. How about on St. Patrick's Day of just this year, and in fact it was done on purpose that it was a, a class action lawsuit, antitrust lawsuit was filed, in New Jersey, the day after Selection Sunday, there you go. on purpose, mm -hmm. by high-powered attorney Jeff Kessler, uh, his lawsuit differs from the O'Bannon one in that it is seeking compensation for student athletes for their likenesses in autographs, videos, flats, imagery, jerseys. Wow. Okay? Holy crap. So we're not looking for compensation to be paid directly. We're looking for a cut of the pie of what the NCAA right. and what the colleges have been getting for decades. That's revenue. Hmm. All right. Now, that one's been filed. Let's throw in there that exactly 10 days after Kessler filed his lawsuit, on the 26th of March, it was announced out of Chicago that the National Labor Relations Board has in fact mm -hmm. recognized the Northwestern University football scholars as in fact employees of the college and as a result thereby can unionize. Yep. This whole thing has spun so far out of control. It's not even funny. The whole unionization situation opens up more questions, in my opinion, than it actually answers anything at all. Mm -hmm. We start getting into issues of benefits. You start getting into issues of, of compensation. Who gets compensated? What teams get compensated? If you're scholarship, if you're not scholarship, are we talking women's soccer? Where does where does act? Uh, what, what's the women's uh, collegiate act number that comes in? Act. Uh, yeah, Title Nine. Title Nine. Right? Where does that come into play in mm -hmm. all of this? On who gets compensated and who doesn't? Well, also, the whole situation also, you've is got just your state universities versus your, your private, private institutions, exactly. and of course the unionization thing is is right now falling on that side. But it, you got to know the door is going to eventually be opened. It's once all you being go blown through. open. At exactly. this point right now, it's you know. all being blown right. open. And the bottom line is this. 
Calipari is so absolutely positively correct in his assessment that in fact, as we continue to watch this, and this is why I find this whole story just absolutely compelling, compelling to yeah. watch and develop, is that there is no doubt if there is anyone out there that thinks for one second that in the next 10 years, in the next 15 years, that collegiate sports is going to even resemble anything of what it does right now, you are out of your mind. This whole thing, the whole landscape is going to change and it's going to change dramatically. And unlike what NCAA President Mark Emmerich just said the other day, I think it's going to happen a lot sooner than he might be sitting there thinking as he sits there going, all right, guys, I don't think we have too much to worry about. Gosh, it's going to be years before we can settle all this mess out of court. Any comments? Well, you know, uh, interestingly, the NCAA is uh, on their, they're putting forth a proposal for a new board. Yes. Right, the uh, uh, it's board. A governance. Right, it's a new governance system that they want to have uh, with a steering committee for governance. And what they want to do, uh, basically, is a proposed governance uh, model, giving all of the uh, different conferences uh, some autonomy, but at the same time incorporating um, the voice of uh, the students as well as faculty and administration. Uh, and the proposal calls for the council would be composed of 34 members, one for each of the 32 conferences, and two student athletes. Um, ideally, it's going to be driven for principles of uh, student athlete welfare and not, you know, based on competition. I just find it interesting that we're going to yep. push, kind of yep. push this out. We're going to push this out into the arena despite what actually is going on with some of these other uh, interesting measures, it all revolves around revenue, and it all revolves around what revenue is considered legitimate and what's considered off, you know, hands off. Um, very interesting. Um, that is, is subject to a vote on April 24th. The unionization vote for Northwestern, Northwestern. is due on April 25th. I don't think it's exactly coincidental no, how these things are kind of falling not. in behind one another. I mean, it's, yeah. And There's regardless, of, regardless of the way that union vote goes up in Northwestern, the bottom line is this. We already know that, and I think it's already considered to be a fait accompli, that in fact Northwestern is probably, the students will vote in favor. Probably so. Uh, despite the fact the coaches and, and, and administration of school have already come out to. and said, please right. do not, please do not. Of course, that's what you would expect. Correct. It's going to be appealed to the National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C. And that's where it's all going to end. Well, at least, I don't know if that's where it's all going to end up. I don't think this is all going to end up for a long time. But it is absolutely compelling stuff. Oh, I'm really telling is. you, folks. It really is. Once you <laughs> say, as the NLRB uh, has stated, that uh, the uh, players are, quote, subject to the employer's control, that kind of, that kind of language is inflammatory. Oh, it's, you're not kidding. It's hard to just tamp that one. You're not kidding. All right, uh, real quick, and we'll just run over and we'll take a look at one real quick one at the end here. Uh, and I wasn't here last week to talk about all the mess that went on with the Deshaun Jackson situation from last week. But, of course, that was the hot topic. Yeah, it was As Deshaun story. Jackson was cut from the Eagles, ends up over with the Washington Redskins. And, well, he ended up on an interview on Friday evening at 6 p.m., Exclusive interview with Stephen A. Smith. Went yeah, we for 30 that. minutes. We saw that. Yep. He came out. He's uh, uh, dressed to the nines. Oh, looking, he looked great. Looking all polished oh, and gosh, wonderful and what great. have you. Yeah, yeah. And had all the right things to say, including that, hey, he's a team guy. Mm -hmm. He's a team player, man. And, uh -huh. hey, anybody that ever had a doubt about that, well, uh, I don't know where they were. Well, know. he was there to tell yeah, Al yeah, that come on. I'm going to set their record straight here. Right. Listen, he was such a team guy that when all his teammates were in OTAs on mm -hmm. Monday, mm -hmm. Well, he was on vacation. Yep, that's where uh, Deshaun Jackson. I, I just kind of felt that maybe Deshaun Jackson. What do you think? Should have. Well, he should have been there. Well, you know, look, it's not like it's not it's not like you've been with the team for seven years like he had been with the Eagles. I mean, you know, if you're with the same team for six years, seven years, okay, I understand. But you're with a brand new team, and you're coming out on 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 on, on Friday telling everybody how you're a team guy to Stephen A. Smith, and then you don't come up, but. There's your team guy. All right. Uh, Lucky number 11. <laughs> we won't get into what Mark Rippian had to say about that number. I'm feeling a lot better, folks. I'm feeling a lot better. How about we go over anyway. and take a look at a little... <laughs> Let's get over to our hot drink segment. Uh,
Our hat trick segment this week brought to you by our good friends over at CLW83, Jim and Carl over there. All their podcasts, all their programming, get over there, check them out, CLW83.com. Uh, we got playoffs kicking off yes, on we do. Tuesday. Yeah, we got, we got okay. some great stuff going on Right, playoffs. and we've got a lot of teams setting all kinds of records. Absolutely. And I want to hear about one in particular that I, <laughs> I, I think everybody should just be modeling after. Well, I got a couple, yeah, I got a couple stories here that, it, <laughs> that are just kind of comical, and uh, I got to lead off with the Florida Panthers. Uh, the Florida Panthers uh, saw a brand new owner come in this, uh, this past September. Uh, uh, Vinny uh, Viola came in. He has money to spend, and he guaranteed that with Coach Kevin Deneen and GM Dale Talon, things are going to be much better than they ever were. I mean, this guy's a West Point grad. Uh, he comes from uh, New York. He knows the markets. This guy's all about it. Well... They're setting records, absolutely, in Florida, folks. Uh, right now, they're not the worst team in the NHL, but they're terribly, terribly close. Right. You know what they did? They went and they obtained uh, goalie Roberto Luongo right, uh, right in the offseason uh, from Vancouver. <clears throat> and this was going to help them uh, become a mainstay, a backstop. Uh, they sent Tim Thomas out to Vancouver. Um, they brought in uh, some young prospects, a 20-year sophomore, uh, Jonathan Huberdu. Uh, they picked up 18-year-old draft pick from the uh, Finnish. Uh, he actually played for the Olympic team, uh, a youngster named Alexander Barkov. And they've got the nucleus, the core. Well, I got bad news. Nothing has gone right for this team since. Uh, most recently, it was revealed that their leading scorer on Florida this year a young lad named Scotty Upshaw, we remember he oh, did yeah. a couple of cups of coffee here in, in Philadelphia, yep. is a team leading scorer with, how about, are you ready? Go ahead. 36 points. Now that's not 36 goals or 36 <laughs> assists. That's a total of 36 total points. Now, folks, just to give you an idea of how bad that really ranks up, the last time that the league had a leading point scorer that low would have been 39 points put up by Scott Pellerin in Minnesota's inaugural year of 2001. And he only appeared in 58 games right now. We've got Upshaw in 73 games. Wow. These guys can't buy a goal. They can't buy a point. It's very, very bad what's going on in Florida. Now, in order to mask their poor attendance, which naturally you can imagine they've had. That's been that way for years now. They've had some bad attendance. And again, this was something else uh, Viola said. Listen, we're going we're gonna to address this. Don't worry. This guy bought up not only the team. He bought up the operating rights of the rink. Uh, he bought up the nine uh, acres around the rink for future development. I mean, there's absolutely every reason to believe things are going to things are going to go up. Unfortunately, the poor attendance has resulted in the team hanging up large curtains at the goal yep. zone of each end of the arena, effectively taking out about 1,500 seats on each end of the arena, selling lower tier tickets <laughs> for about just 25 bucks. This is a 19,000 seat capacity arena, making it one of the largest in the NHL. And they are putting in approximately 14,000 bodies in those seats. That's the third lowest in the NHL. So you can They're see everything, that many in? everything has, well, there's some, there's some reason to speculate those numbers are inflated because you see a lot of empty seats. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, listen, the good news for anybody that is a Florida fan for the last two games tonight and uh, on Sunday, you can still get home seats for how about three bucks? Wow. Four bucks? And that's, that's the going rate. Not sure what's going to happen in Florida. It looks like a fire sale, despite the fact that there's tons of money out Dude, there. they've talked about moving this team now for a couple of years, yeah. and yet we've got new ownership here. What the heck? Well, you know, uh, Bettman put that all to rest. I, I mean, know. at this point, there's a lease agreement in place for them through, like, 2022. They're not moving this team anywhere. Jeez. Uh, the only hope is that they can do something good. I mean, uh, Dale Talon remains the GM. There's no, there's no threat right now. He's going anywhere, and uh, Coach Kevin Deneen has not had it successful year but he's evidently better than what they had before so we'll see we'll see what's going to happen but 
Yeah, you want to talk about some some terrible, terrible situation. Unfortunately, Florida continues to mire, and yep. they haven't been yep. relevant since about 1995. Now, another one that kind of jumped out at me, because you're talking about teams that came in promising, is got to be Vancouver Canucks. Mm -hmm. And the Vancouver Canucks, I mean, there's a few things that are going on. Vancouver Canucks ownership right now is threatening libel. <laughs> okay. Um, they're going to miss the playoffs for the first time since 2008. And quite frankly, we're waiting to see if they're going to expel their coach. You know, they've recently expelled their GM. So let's start at the top of the order. Our team owner, Francesco Ancolini. Yep, yep. Ancolini has been in charge of this team since 2008, and he owns it. I mean, this man is no uh, charlatan. He does no business. But interestingly, um, he had to take some task with what was put out there in the media. A couple of uh, separate beat reporters from the province and Globe and Mail out there in Vancouver, right. each separately put out uh, after the firing of their GM uh, stories indicating basically, you know, they're firing the GM. The coach is probably going to go next. Well, how can they do this? The owner himself personally signed off on the coach's hiring. Well, Anquilini will have no part of it. He um, actually texted to uh, the uh, Globe and Mail reporter, on his article, quote, I read your article today. You're a prick. He then followed it up with his attorney who sent an email to both of, right. both of the publications the indicating that they had better uh, not only retract their statement, but issue a formal apology or they will be slapped with a lawsuit for libel. This man's basically saying, I didn't hire the guy. The other guy did. I fired him. What do I know? I'm only in charge. Exactly. I can't be held responsible. I'm the boss. <laughs> this, is, this is comical. This is comical is stuff. Comical. Set, up, set up the <clears throat> pup tents because it only gets better. Now, interestingly, our, our ousted uh, GM, a uh, fellow named Mike Gillis, has been around since 2008, interestingly, because that's when Alcolini came in and took over the Vancouver uh, the Vancouver uh, uh, Enterprise. This man has had a lot of problems. I mean, they did go to the Stanley Cup. Let's not forget, folks, uh, back in 2008. Yep. I mean, Vancouver was that close. Yep. They got to Game 7. They lost in Game 7. What happened? The city rioted. Yep. I mean, we, we may remember. Uh, Acolini's response... Things were on fire. <laughs> yeah, well, they turned things over. I yep. mean, it was a mess. Acolini's response to the press at that time... Uh, when they were asking him, hey, you know, so much for your uh, great ideas, he more or less told them, you know what, you can all go fornicate elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so the idea of uh, telling the media that you're a prick is not exactly new this to the guy. Yeah, right, he's used to this. In the meantime, how embarrassing really is it for him out there in, in Vancouver? Well, right now, I mean, we're looking, at, we're looking at Gillis, and I want to tell you a few things about this guy. He's not been the best GM. He had a top tandem mm -hmm. goaltender. Uh, duo in Roberto Luongo, who we mentioned, got mm -hmm. traded to, wait for it, Florida. Mm -hmm. He also had Corey Schneider back in the day as the backup. Well, they've al allowed Corey Schneider just in, in this past draft period to go to New Jersey. He's going to apparently be the uh, new replacement for Marty Brodeur as that struggling franchise looks to go forward next year. And because of Luongo's long-term front-loaded uh, salary cap manipulating ridiculous 12 year $64 million no trade clause contract. He had to do whatever he could to offload Luongo, and he did so in a heartbeat. They, they, Vancouver never got anything for them. Uh, he strangled them, uh, the organization, financially. Uh, he then proceeded to do a couple more trades with, wait for it, Florida. Uh, isn't it funny how we keep coming back to them, uh, in which he picked up uh, Florida D-man Keith Ballard, who proceeded to miss more than one year over the three years that he was with them, right. producing uh, pitiful numbers, uh, resulting in an amnesty buyout. Okay, so they it, it just jettisoned uh, Ballard with that. Uh, also picked up winger David Booth from Florida, Looks like he's going to be also the result of another compliance buyout probably this year. Uh, he made 37 draft picks over the period of time from 2008 to the present, none of which have proven to be anything uh, beyond marginal. 
And of course, he oversaw the firing of Coach Alain Vigneault and the hiring of one John Tortorella. Not according to him, though. Well, uh, the GM will take uh, the GM will take it, but it's the owner. No, uh, the owner said I had nothing to do with that. I was on the golf course. <laughs> so, uh, interestingly, Vigneault is guiding his team to the postseason, and Tortorella is best remembered for guiding his team to the Calgary dressing room and that debacle. Yes, which exactly. Was ridiculous, uh, mad, mad yes. penalties over what two games were fights going on yeah, after yeah, two yeah. minutes of, of starting time. Um, so, interestingly, um, the presser following um, Anaheim's 3 nothing loss, uh, which effectively put uh, Vancouver out of the playoffs, uh, you know, the normally uh, verbose uh, Tortorella basically said, and I guess this comes from a guy that knows it's the end is near, you know, it's not time to be critical now. You, you know, real quick, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I like Tortorella. Uh, and oh, I, he's interesting. And I, uh, frankly, he, I frankly yeah. think that he's kind of, I'm not saying he's not a victim of his own circumstances at times, uh, but I think that he finds himself frequently placed in situations where he gets used and kind of pushed around a bit. Mm. And I, I, I think that he had that kind of a situation up in, in the, at the Rangers. And I think, obviously, he's had it here. He's only been here one year. Right. I, I think if this guy isn't here next year, I think it's a terribly unfair situation for Tortorella. I, in other words, I guess basically what I'm saying is I think he's a better coach than what a lot of people have been led to believe. I well, don't know where you are. Yeah, I, I agreed. I mean, there is, a, there is some school of thought, and I buy into it, that in fact the problems that are going on in Vancouver precede John Tortorella. Exactly. And he was brought into a broken down uh, system that he couldn't fix. Uh, so much so that there was... Uh, right around the time of the Calgary, you know, debacle in which, you know, they yeah, basically, right. like I say, it was ridiculous penalties in, in the first, like, 30 seconds of that game. I mean, in some respects, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't blame Tortorella for what he did, but go ahead. Well, right. Uh, there was some speculation at that point that the GM really had no idea what to do. And he had, at that point, gone to coach and said, yeah, I know. I listen, too, yeah. um, we're not really sure how to fix this. Yeah. This is your team. Kind of spun why out don't control. you Why don't you take over? Yeah. And at that point, then, in fact, you know, Tortorella brought what he brings yeah. best, a very defensive-oriented game. Yeah. We're going to fisticuffs. We're not going to be pushed around. And if we can't make uh, headway, we're going to make noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, in yeah. fact, you know, he, he very well could be a, a victim of circumstance. There's no two ways around it. Does it mean his job is salvaged? Probably not. Probably. Considering that the city uh, rioted, you can imagine that fan base is very, well, very, it's, very it's, 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 annoyed it's, it's, to have missed the playoffs. You for and the I first talked about it. It's a strong, oh, loyal fan base. Absolutely it's Canadian, right. and we know that there's they, only six of them up there. Exactly. And, and they bring at out this point, Frat House Mike. You know, uh, apart from Montreal, who else is going to postseason play from Canada? Yeah, it's not there's no real, representation. Not real, lo really looking good. <laughs> I mean, Toronto had every reason to be there. They're out. Uh, looked like Vancouver had every reason to be there. They are out. Ottawa was never really in the conversation. Calgary was never really right. in the conversation. Edmonton was never really in the conversation this year. So, I mean, it's, it's sad. It's really sad. But let's not, let's not lose it because we are, we are going to be looking at some postseason play. I was just going to say, we're looking at, we're going to the playoffs. And it's final. And I mean, pretty much. We just got done talking about those who aren't in consideration. Right. Who is in consideration? Who's still in the bubble? How about that? Well, at this point, is I mean, there anybody on the bubble? Well, yeah, there's a couple still on the bubble, but I mean, pretty much what we've got here is a clinch in, yeah. in terms of the East think, and the West. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, here I we don't, do, right, You've yeah. got your four leaders. You've got your four leaders up here. And uh, the only thing yet to be determined, and this could still go either way, and that's what's kind of fun about it. It's the only reason to be interested if you're on this board is who's going to win the President's Trophy uh, as the winningest team overall in the league. Uh, but essentially, on the east and on the west, it's been it's been figured from one through eight. Um, and the way it looks now, uh, our number one Boston would be playing number eight, uh, Detroit Red Wings, okay. who finally made it in. They are a healthy team and should give Boston a, a nice fight. Uh, your number two Pittsburgh Penguins are looking at the resurgent Columbus Blue Jackets. Now, I'll be honest with you. Three weeks ago, folks, Columbus Blue Jackets had fallen off. And they were not looking like a very strong team, but they have strung together multiple wins. They have won when they shouldn't have. And they're a number seven team going up against the number two. 
quite frankly, it's no surprise to understand that in the series uh, regular year, Pittsburgh's won. They've won every game against Columbus. So yeah. I'm not saying this will be compelling, but this should be. Uh, well, <coughs> I'll tell you what, Pittsburgh's going to come out a little black and blue from Congrats this Congrats to, Columbu- to Columbus. I mean, for gosh. <laughs> no, there's no And I mean, that's, that's one of those small markets that, well, that deserves a pat absolutely. on the Absolutely. I mean, and this is what's fun about sort of like a NCAA. It's a bracket yeah. thing. Uh, our Philadelphia Flyers right here in this region are looking at uh, Montreal Canadiens. It's a much more favorable matchup. Anyone will tell you from this area yep. uh, instead of uh, New York Rangers. Rangers. Yep. And the number uh, five New York Rangers will, in fact, match up against uh, Tampa Bay. And what's fun about this is we have the trade of the captains that you might remember right. uh, that went on. Uh, Callahan at, and uh, St. Louis. Right, exactly. So you do have uh, a nice uh, rivalry matchup uh, yep. in, in the making Got to hope that happens. Yeah, I like that. Now, on the west side, number one Ducks are going to be uh, uh, playing up against the uh, Dallas Stars. Dallas Stars, another one of those teams that just made it in under the wire. Uh, Sidekick Zone, St. Louis, they've been there all year. My favorite to win the Cup on the West, uh, or at least play for the Cup on the West. They're going to be taking on the uh, Minnesota Wild, another team that was on the bubble. Yep. And they just another came one, on. small market, yep. got them on the back. Exactly, and they just came on strong enough at the end there to, to secure a seventh spot. Uh, Colorado Avalanche, Patrick Waugh. Um, there is some chatter about him being uh, uh, Adams uh, Trophy Coach of the Year because this is his rookie year. Yep. And they played consistently, and one of the only teams that has beaten every other team in the league was uh, Colorado. Every other team in the league, the other 29, Colorado has beaten them uh, in at least one matchup. They're going to face uh, the L.A. Kings, perennial favorite, no doubt about it. And your number four and five would match up uh, last year's Stanley Cup champion, uh, Chicago Blackhawks versus the San Jose Sharks. Um, on the west, on the east, I'll be honest with you, I really like all the matchups. And there's going to be a lot of black and blue. Some of the favorites are coming out. Some of the underdogs are coming out. No matter who does, there's going to be some black and blue teams here uh, as they go to that Oh, there's no round. doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And what's fun <laughs> is to look at it as a bracket. And that takes us right to our... Yeah, you're talking about it being fun, thing. and this is a way to get to really get it fun. Listen, right now, you know, uh, in our frat house, on our Facebook page, yep. you can join this challenge. We've got plenty of room. There is no limit. Yep. And it's going to be set no up... No cost. Up. It's going to be set up just like NCAA, but you're going to have your eight teams on the west, eight teams on the east. It's going to be set on the 16th, at which point you can go ahead and make your choices... But go ahead and I. You I got to get to our Facebook page. You got to IM us. You got to give us your right. email address, and we will get you an exclusive Come invite on in. to our group. This is another one of our. We do these. We do what? Constantly. We must do. There's we must something. do what? At least there's six, seven something. of these fantasy game things right. during there's the course something. of the year. So there's always something. Here's another one. And this is going to be a lot of fun because uh, you know you've probably heard me speculate. Maybe you'll have some speculation going forward. Yep. Certainly, sidekick too. But once you make up your own bracket, then listen, we'll be more than happy. We want you to comment. Uh, watch the show. Feel free to comment. Let us know, hey, who do you have going yep, all the way? Absolutely. Because at this point, it's, it's open. It's open. It's a lot that's of fun. That's what's fun. A lot of fun. And, and you know, we, we, we've talked about it before, too. Really, when it comes right down to it, there's no better postseason than oh, the no, NHL this is, this is when overtime matters, yeah, too. Really, no more of that shootout yeah, nonsense. Yeah, thank you. The gimmick thank is you. done. I mean, thank you. The, the NHL postseason, it's long. I mean, mind you, it is long. It's oh, two yeah. months long. Oh, absolutely. But it's, it is Once a lot of fun. Once you get to this point, this is when, I mean, this is the most fun you can have, I think. Well, in, and we'll be coming back next week, and we're going to be taking a look at where all the, you know, finalized. We'll finalize right. where all things. And, and we'll be probably into games two, maybe two, maybe three by that point. By that point. By next Thursday. And we'll take a look at where things are standing in the first round of the playoffs. Absolutely. We'll name some names, tell you who to absolutely. watch out for. <laughs> All right, there's our hat trick segment for this week brought to you by our friends over at CLW83. We got to jump in to NASCAR. Yeah, man. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And that's brought to you by our friends down in Baltimore, down in the Washington region. Chris and company down there, great friends. Oh, they're great guys. Doing wonderful stuff for us. Putting our show on. Herb FM Sports Radio. Got to check them out. Herb FM. Dot com. Mm-hmm. All right, get over there and check them out. They're rebroadcasting us at least 
once, twice, sometimes I three times a week. I'll tell you, I listen. We I do the classic, show and I listen. We had classic shows on the other day. <laughs> you, you know that we've been on long enough to have classic shows? I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Fred House, Mike, when I show up with you, every show's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. What is that? It's a major award. It's a major award. Let's get over and take a look at what happened in NASCAR this week. We had our seventh race. Down at the Texas Motor Speedway, I, you know, I said it early on in the, in the show, I am so tired of rain delays, for God's sake. Mm. The storyline again this yep. week, uh, a couple of them, all right, we can go, we can, we, listen, we're going to talk about the, the, the point scoring, the new point scoring situation, the new system that they've mm -hmm. got in place there. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the fact that there's been no repeat winners. Right. But we're also going to start it off by talking about the fact that the rain delays and the weather delays have just been excruciating this season so far so much to the point that this week it wasn't delayed by hours how about we delayed it by a talk to you tomorrow day. yeah talk to you tomorrow we came to, on monday that's mm -hmm. when this and, and by the way we got we had a short week you know they talk about football in four oh, weeks yeah you know as it turns out just by virtue be of a short it's week. a saturday night race <laughs> exactly. it's not even like it's a sunday so, you lost one day you're actually losing almost two days this week right but as I pointed out, seven races so far, seven different winners this week. Yep. Third at, one uh, affected by rain. Exactly. This mm. one, this one, this week, uh, Texas Motor Speedway. Joey Logano came in first. Yeah. Jeff Gordon that? came in second. Kyle Busch, starting out at the 29th spot, uh, came in third. Uh, Brian Vickers, uh, number 55 over there with the uh, Waltrip Pro Racing, number four. And Kyle Larson, as you uh, alluded oh, and as man. we've talked about, mm -hmm. came in fifth. How about it? How All about right? that kid? How about yeah, that kid? Uh, that kid's a, uh, I'll tell you what, I that know. kid's compelling. He's starting to make me a believer, I must be honest. Well, you know, uh, here we go. I mean, uh, it's a 1.5-mile uh, uh, oval, right? Uh, he had never been on it before. Yep. He had said, I've never driven this track. Uh, what does he do but his third top ten in the last four races and his second top five? I mean, this kid's running yeah, as though he believer. has already had like a full season of Sprint Cup under his belt. I now love you it. said he's still he's still a little bit behind uh, uh, Austin Dillon. Austin yeah, Dillon for the rookie amazingly, of the year. it has. has but your if this kid keeps this up, rookie, we'll have this locked uh, up. By I him. think he's. I think he's. I think he's definitely the guy. Yeah. I, I really like him. I really like him. And Logano, that's just listen. His fourth race, fourth Sprint race, Logano in six years. Okay, interesting. And uh, at Texas, he is now the youngest driver to ever win at Texas. How about that one? You know, interesting. There was some chatter is there. 23? Uh, yes. 23. There was some chatter that maybe he went to the sprint series a little early. He maybe should have stayed at the nationwide mm -hmm. level, uh, groomed for another year I might or two. Have known but there was an open argument. seat. They needed to fill. He yep. jumped in the spot. And I'll tell you what, nice job. I mean, he doesn't have a ton of wins, but boy, was this impressive. <clears throat> Uh, other storylines in this rare Monday race, mm -hmm. uh, we had two previous season winners so far uh, uh, just this season, right. both Dale Jr. and Kevin Harvick out early in the race. Dale mm -hmm. went out in lap 12 in a fiery wreck after wow. he bounced off the wall. Frightening. Too. Um, Harvick out at lap 28 Oof. with an engine failure, and it seems Harvick can't seem to catch a break know-how in the no. past couple of weeks after... A, a win what in week two or three yeah he won he a just, phoenix and he's had nothing but mechanical yeah. problems with that car yeah. when that car runs it is really freaky fast which it says on the side right on the side yeah but the problem is for whatever but, reason whether the, it's the tires, sustainability whether it's, sustainability yeah, there's there's been issues he's tearing yep. up tires i mean in this case the engine blew up he said on the radio he had no idea it was even coming exactly uh another storyline that i kind of felt oh, oh i felt pretty good about going into and you can confirm this uh tony stewart I kind of whispered a little How quietly it? You to called you it. Last I gotta say, Fred House Mike, you called it last week. Midweek, <laughs> midweek, even yep. before qualifying, I kind of whispered very quietly. Watch he had Tony laryngitis. Stewart. He did. Have I did. <laughs> I did. I did. And I was coughing a lot. And I said, "But watch Tony Stewart." Right. Could this be the week? And uh, well, Tony Stewart ended up getting the pole. Son of a gun! I'm feeling pretty darn confident. Come. Uh, Saturday, and he got a top ten because he finished in ten spot, so he did get another top, top 10, ten. But led seventy four of the, of the laps, thirty four right. laps. There weren't too many laps. And That's I was correct. feeling pretty darn good yeah, about well, Tony I, Stewart. I bet you were. You gotta think Tony Stewart's gonna gonna nail one down here sooner than later. All right, but let's go real quick. Take a look at the uh, leaderboard. Uh, and again, you know, it's an interesting thing because we're talking about the, the new point scoring situ mm -hmm. situation, and you know. 
it, it's weird to look at the 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 the, the point scores because well, as we know, it doesn't year, matter. Compared really, compared to years before, we really should be right. ranking, and maybe I'm going to have to even change it. We might have to start ranking by wins because really that's what's counting. Right. Because when you take a look at this off the board, all right, which should be evident off the board, and we're only showing the top five off the board. Dale Jr. right now in sixth. But how about Kevin Harvick at 26th? 26th. 26th. But that's really not accurate, folks, because he's got himself a win. So we already know he's in the chase. Well, that's true. Until you get multiple winners, and I think we're going to see multiple winners eventually. Well, ultimately, you're okay. going to, yeah. And once multiple winners start entering the, the conversation, well, now one win isn't enough. And again, points sort of do matter. Well, then at that point, yeah, maybe they right. will. Maybe they will. But, but I'll be still, honest with you. You're going, to rank by, you're going to rank by the number of wins. This time last year, Kevin Harvick would have been mortified to know he was in 26th position. Yep. Because points mattered then. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's a different animal this year. All right, but here we go. We're heading into week eight. And where are we heading? Well, we're heading to what? What? What's yeah, I this? Know, I What's know. this? It's Darlington. About a month too early. Huh? Huh? About a month too early. Yeah, right. We're going to talk about that one in a moment. We're heading to Darlington, South Carolina. Uh, and we're going to go visit the lady in black. Yep. Saturday night racing. Saturday night racing, folks. 6.30 p.m. Eastern time on Fox. Now, if there's but, a rain delay, does this then become a day race? <laughs> we certainly have we had, had our, day races we become night races is this, it's going to be the we reverse we certainly have had our share of night racing already you know it used Trying to be a nice drive. novelty now it's kind of like become mundane Whew, yeah. Wow. Yeah. oh what another night race yeah oh. well they do have like well, what do you got for you got a you got a few little tidbits for us on darlington real quick well, well, interesting yeah. because this has been a, a, a track that's kind of gotten pushed around recently. Yeah, a little it's unfortunate. Bit. I mean, Darlington at one time used to have it used to have actually two races. Two races, right? right? It had the Rebel the Rebel Four Hundred as the spring race, and it had the Southern Five Hundred, which was Labor Day weekend, and that was the case until two thousand three, uh, in which case the Southern Five Hundred went out to California. Uh, so what they did was they kept the. Uh, remaining race and they had it on Mother's Day weekend and it became pretty much a tradition I mean it was a good weekend they had it as an evening race so that the, you know in fact right. on Mother's Day the, the drivers and everybody could spend time with moms for that day but they it actually generated a lot of interest it got a lot of lather in the area and just this year once again um, Darlington kind of got kicked in the shins and they've lost um, to Kansas for that that same weekend date of Mother's Day. So now that's going to be a Kansas race, and here we are in Darlington about four weeks early. Uh, it shouldn't hopefully be an effect from, uh, a poor effect from the standpoint of rain. I don't think they're calling for inclement weather. Yeah. But once again, you're talking about a, a, a track that's long, long in it's the got tooth. history. Right, you know, 1949, 1950, <laughs> this was built. A um, lot, a lot of famous drivers have been there, and it kind of just sort of keeps getting kicked under uh, well, and the thinking is the that rough. this is a lot to do about trying to promote some of the newer tracks, like well, the Kansas, Kansas and the Kansas is getting promoted. There was some, you know, there's some political pull there. There's a casino there. They're hoping to generate revenue mm. now uh, to help build that. Kansas is a relatively new track by comparison. Um, I'm not exactly, you know, a purist by any means, and I don't confess to be, but I know a lot of our fans that are NASCAR people, certainly our technical director, go back in, in the history of NASCAR and understand NASCAR for what it is, and a lot of it is tradition. And here we go with, with sort of a fickle, a fickle thing that kind of just jams up the tradition. Yep. But hopefully yep. it won't matter. It doesn't mean... It's not going to be an exciting, compelling race. And there in Darlington, just for fun, Hendrick Motorsports has the most wins. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that uh, under the current sprint format with 14. Um, and going back in its history, Chevy's the winningest manufacturer. They have uh, 40 of uh, the 110 wins. And Ford is the next uh, winningest manufacturer with 28 of those 110. A uh, little side history. Ford's there been doing pretty good this year, though. Oh, my God, they have been. Roush. And, and since and we're talking about it, let's get to, well, we don't have sidekick here, but you've got sidekick's picks for us, yes? Yeah, I do have sidekick's picks, and, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share them with you. I'm going to share them with you, but before, before we do that, I wanted to just throw out some things for those of our fantasy, uh, fantasy friends out there real quick. Um, some interesting things. Jeff Gordon. You got it. You got to talk about Jeff Gordon when you're talking about uh, Darlington, and here's why. Jeff Gordon, okay, throw some numbers fast. Leads active drivers with seven wins. He leads 
Active Drivers, second place, uh, acti the wins are seven. Uh, second place finishes four. Top fives, 19. Eight of the last uh, 10 races here with uh, 12th. Uh, well, wait a second, where am I here? Yeah, okay. Uh, top 10s, 22. Laps led, 1,700. Okay. Now, it goes to, well, he started the most. Yes, he has. He's got 33 starts here. Average starting position, 6.7. Average running position, 8.1. Darlington, Jeff Gordon, could be a match made in heaven. If you're looking on the roster, you may want to consider this guy. Other notables, uh, Jimmy Johnson's got three total wins, but two in uh, the last 10 years. Um, Greg Biffle, two wins. Every one of your Gibbs drivers, you like that guy Kyle Busch? Okay, he's got a win here. Denny Hamlin's got a win here. Mackenzie's got a win here, all in yep. the last 10 years. Yep. Uh, Mark Martin, Reagan Smith uh, kind of round out that top uh, 10. Uh, Jeff Gordon's got your best overall driver rating. Um, also in there, Hamlin, Biffle, Johnson, Kyle Busch, Casey Kane. Casey Kane! That's for our, uh, our gal Jen over there. Casey Kane has four poles mm -hmm. and leads active drivers with the number of poles. So Casey King can run strong here. So keep it in mind, um, if you start in the top 10 uh, position, you win a great percentage of the time. Uh, your poll winner has won a great number of, uh, your poll winner or your second place uh, have won almost like 95% of the time at Darlington. So placement on the track actually does have a lot to do with it. So what does Sidekick have to tell us about uh, this? All right, this week we are heading east from Fort Worth, Texas to Darlington, South Carolina for the Bojangles Southern 500. Yeehaw! Some of you may know her better as the Lady in Black or the track too tough to tame. This mile and a half track is quite unique with 23 to 25 degree banking that makes it the fastest groove right up against the wall instead of the traditional lower grooves we see at many other tracks. By racing around the top of the track, we see drivers get a little too close and earn their, darling, their Darlington stripe. Will your driver be earning the stripe this weekend? Is this our Cardi? <laughs> <laughs> Ralphie Boy. <laughs> I'm the sidekick. <laughs> All right, so who do we got this week? Our number one pick is none other than the illustrious, <laughs> wait for it, Jeff Gordon. At 2725, the only driver to, to claim to have tamed Darlington with seven victories over 33 appearances, which we just mentioned. Number two, Denny Hamlin. $23.50, Hamlin has an average finish of 5.4. That's his average finish place in just eight races and has finished second in the last two. Jimmy Johnson, 27.75, has finished in the top 10, 73% of the time he's run. He's also won the uh, last uh, three races. And to round out the roster, we've got Landon Castle for a mere $7.25. He averages a 28th place finish and the lucky dog again this week reed sorensen 675 still has more fantasy points for the season than any other driver in his point range he has more points than danica patrick eric amarola ricky stenhouse jr also known as ricky patrick and martin truex jr who are all at least double his price now his total roster this is pretty good $92.50, you could pay us. more, you could pay more, but why bother? And I got to agree with him on that, because looking at, looking at the way it breaks down. He's got enough for some popcorn. Those, he could buy a box of popcorn. Absolutely. Right. And that's about what you'd need for a box of popcorn, right? Yeah. About eight bucks. So nice job. There's side Unless you're fixed. at the Masters. We'll get those posted if up. You're at the Masters then. Uh, we, we get those posted up for you on our Facebook page. All right, let's go take a look at our Front House Sports Fantasy League standings. And, well, the fantasy team, Side right. Explorers, hangs up there at number two. Yep. Uh, sitting at, I'm sitting right now at number five. Nice job. Sidekicks Team Blood Pack sitting at number six. Right behind you. Uh, and we're waiting for our others to yeah. catch up and get on well, that that's top okay. 10 board. That's okay. 
Yeah, Good looking I'm, out I'm, to Nicole down in Texas, our frat house. Yeah, we got friend try, number try one. And knock her off, I know. Sammy's up there at uh, number number three. He's been on our show before, so I'm under the radar. Uh, our technical director Brandon's under the under the radar this week. Uh, certainly, Jen's under the radar. But get, look out! This week at Darlington, we're going to turn it all got around. To, you know, listen. We're going to turn it all around. Part of the fantasy stuff we do. We're talking about that uh, NHL. Oh yeah, we, we got, got the get NHL bracket. On we got this going. All right, over listen. Here. <clears throat> Before we get out of uh, NASCAR, I just want to bring up this great story, which I thought was just a, 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 kind of a public interest kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Edwards uh, appeared uh, out with the Kansas City Royals mm -hmm. on Tuesday, uh, shagging down some pop flies, uh, taking a little BP practice, and, uh, well, then ultimately ended up throwing out the first uh, ceremonial ball for the opening uh, between the uh, Royals and the Tampa Bay Rays. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. I'm going to tell you, apparently the reports were he had some heat on that fastball that he threw. Yeah, no kidding. Just a little bit low yeah, and a man. little bit outside. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Carl Edwards is the guy. I could see this guy in a Kansas City Royals uniform or any uniform. Listen, I'd take him on my Phil's uniform right here without any problem whatsoever. How about it? This guy should be the face of NASCAR. Yeah, Make no yeah. mistake. Good for you. And I got to wonder whether Donovan McNabb. Happened to witness uh, a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm just right. curious. Well, you know, they're not athletic or anything. No, they're not. Absolutely not. <laughs> All right, listen, many, many thanks to our friends over at Herb FM Sports Radio for bringing our NASCAR segment, yeah. our sidekicks picks, all of the stuff that we do when we talk NASCAR right mm -hmm. here every single week on Frat House Sports. Mm -hmm. All right, how about our Frat House Sports Facebook post of the week? Uh, I'm not sure quite how to take this one. I was actually feeling a little bit uh, kind of put out. What happened? The number one uh, post for this week happened to be the post of last week's show, which for all intent well, purposes, that was a great show. that's a good thing. That that's was a good, great show. Except I wasn't was in nothing. last week's show. Oh. Who's in charge there? And I'm just wondering whether, in fact, that's why everybody was uh, clamoring to that week's show. What? Uh, uh, suddenly I'm not on it, and suddenly that gets it. Hey, listen. No, thank no. you very much, folks. I appreciate all of that. Uh, no, no, that was appreciate. Jim Williams. Yeah, that's Jim what, Williams. Uh, Fine. He, Good luck, showboy. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Right. Thanks, Jim. All right, listen, you got to get over to our Facebook page. <clears throat> Look us up, Frat House Sports. Give us a like. Jump onto that. And no, I won't yell at you if you like shows that I'm not in. Hey, listen, it's a good thing sometimes when I'm not on. I, think. I don't know, dude. There seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. I think that was directed at you. <laughs> 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 All right, and don't forget, <laughs> don't forget our fredhousesports.net website. We're mm -hmm. constantly updating new stuff on that Good. one. Yep. Uh, and we'll have some new content. What do we got? Countdown. Uh, and, countdown. And, and, countdown. We got what a countdown, countdown to the Louis uh, to the to the Kentucky Derby. Not the Kentucky baseball cap. No, no, no. Kentucky Not the Derby. Kentucky Fedora. Kentucky Derby coming up in just less than a month. Less than a okay. month. We got our poll up there for this week's uh, NASCAR race. And, uh, well, now that I'm feeling a little bit better, uh, hopefully uh, you will actually see some new content going up there for myself this yep. week. Maybe something on the NCAA and all the mess going oh, on. There's there. plenty to talk about with well, that. Well, you're not kidding. We already you're know. Not kidding. All right. In the meantime, well, mm. there you have it. There's our show. Woof. That Good to be fun. back. I'm thank you. I yeah. appreciate being back. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Nice thank to you. have you back. Thank nice you. to have you back. Uh, and you play back. to win the game. game. Um, and, and we will be back. Next week, and hopefully With we have the whole crew. Right. Hopefully, hopefully we right. have the whole crew all together. Feel better, dude. Uh, in the meantime, you know what you got to do for us? Keep us real. Keep us live. Keep us going. We'll see you next week. Yes. Did, anybody yes. see, did anybody see the bar that actually, they had it up. I think it was on CBS Sports. The bar that actually had it promoted, you know, like you see those little, the, those, those corner bars, you know, the, 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 the kind of, uh, sidewalk type bars you know out in boston area what mm. have you, you know where they're real like you know avant-garde outdoor they seating they got the outdoor thing right, you know okay. and the and the signs up come on in to see yukon why uk oh that is absolute <laughs> silver and gold man <laughs> silver and gold and it was in it was in That's an great. area that should have known better yeah right and i'm yeah, like, you, I'm like I, you believe this yukon why uk oh okay all right